Hey, everybody. Welcome. I'm this is Emily Moyer from Off Planet Radio, and I'm here with Robert Phoenix from 11th House. And this is going to be a joint Off Planet and 11th House ongoing production of Matrix Mash, where Robert and I will run through the weird shit going on in this Matrix. <laughs> And don't, for, don't, don't, don't forget Jasper. He's part of the mask. Yes, too. and Jasper, of course. He's, the, he's our mascot. Robert, welcome. I'm super excited to be starting this venture with you. This is great, Emily. And just to give people kind of an idea of what we're going to be doing is take about a half an hour each week just to break some stuff down that we find interesting, compelling, unusual, and in areas that we might have a little bit of knowledge or some expertise in. And uh, this week, we're going to be looking at a couple of different things, the Serena Williams meltdown and the very odd, strange, unusual uh, interview with Elon Musk and Joe Rogan, since we got a lot of really good uh, energy and, and uh, some really, really good vibes off that Joe Rogan piece that we did, we decided to go with that a little bit more. Cool. Well, I'm super excited to get down to this. So, all right. So you and I sensed something was coming with Serena Williams because in the weeks leading up to the U.S. Open and in the early stages of it, you and I were having discussions in the background about these unusual Chase commercials, which, you know, if you really think about it, Robert, since the very beginning of our friendship, you and I have been having these discussions about the strange commercials surrounding tennis uh, tournaments from the very beginning. We used to talk about some of those uh, Adidas shoe commercials, remember, and yeah. whatnot. So, you know, we're always able to sort of start picking up on some of this. And um, maybe we should, do you want to start with this sort of a little bit of this strange sort of uh, uh, chase commercials? And the, should we start with the commercials and then get into what actually happened? Or do we want to start with what happened and then? Well, well so yeah, why don't we start with the commercial? Because I, yeah. I think <laughs> it's a good lead in. Um, one of the things that has occurred to me is that, advertisers are, are they're really kind of even though they're, they're trying to get their hooks into the Millennials um, they're actually starting to direct their message to the group of uh, young young people that are just coming into um, sort of legal voting age and mm -hmm. alcohol buying age you know this is generation Z and generation Z pops up right around 1996 so they're 21 years old, 21 years old and younger. I think the youngest uh, person of Generation Z is around 11 or 12 right now. So um, maybe maybe even like nine. So these commercials- If they have are, a cell phone, basically if they have a phone. And almost all of them do. Yeah. But this is a generation that is very different than the, than the millennials. Like their, their attire is sportwear. Mm -hmm. They run around in shorts, they run around in athletic tees. They run around in sneaker shoes. They're very status oriented when it comes to athletic wear. So this is a big time for companies like Nike. And even though Chase is not an athletic company using an athlete and portraying an athlete is part of this kind of new movement to really get into the minds and the pocketbooks. Of well, also it's about paying for stuff with your phone. The commercials she's in is about being able to go to the ATM and use your phone to get cash out. So you don't have to use your card or that's being right. able to use your phone to pay at the different pay points at stores and stuff. So that's a great lead in to the actual commercial itself. And you and I have talked about this before. She's out on a jog. It looks like it might be like the Florida Keys. It's Miami, or some yeah. Miami. She's out. She's out on a, She's out on a jog. She's wearing one of her Serena outfits. And she comes across a vendor. And the vendor has this, it's a pendant, but it really looks like a talisman. Mm -hmm. And the talisman, uh, let me, uh, I'll, I'll bring it up here so people can actually see it. We'll do a little uh, share screen here so that we can um, get an idea of what it looks like. So here's the talisman. And it is... You can clearly see what looks like fish bones, although they're kind of headed maybe in the wrong direction, but it looks like an, kind of an inverted fish in some ways. Like it's a fish like, hanging from a hook, like it's been caught yeah. by its tail or something and it's hanging. Yeah, yeah. yeah but, but there's no flesh on it. It's just bones. Yeah. And you can see that it's inside of like this bell jar, which is a very interesting place for it to be. Um, the bell jar is a famous novel by Sylvia Plath who is a great poet, and it's about um, her life as a poet and being married to Ted Hughes, who was uh, the poet laureate, would eventually become the poet laureate 
of England, and Sylvia Plath, of course, uh, commits suicide. And I believe there's a movie that's based on the bell jar. So there's this idea, it's not just the symbol of the fish, but the bell jar itself, and that Sylvia Plath felt as if she was under the influence or in the kind of this atmosphere of the bell jar and that she, she couldn't escape it. Well, here we have this symbol inside the bell jar, which is uh, this fish symbol, which is very Piscean. And, and, the, and the Piscean piece is a really important piece for you and I and people to focus on because number one, we have Neptune and Pisces and Serena is running by the beach. So we have this Neptunian imagery. Um, we have Chiron, which is in Aries, this is such a fascinating piece too, because one of the things that you and I will talk about as we move this forward is her discussion with the judges of Wimbledon and complaining. You mean about, at U.S. Open? At the U.S. Open? Yeah, I'm sorry, U.S. Open. Complaining about um, how other men are treated. Right. Right. Now, some people would hear how men are treated. Well, she's saying how. Well, we're going to talk about that, and that's a Chiron and Aries moment mm -hmm. where there's this kind of wounding between men and women, right? That men have a different kind of standard with how they can express their emotions than women do. This is clearly Chiron and Aries coming at it from the backside or the inverted side. But Chiron's going retrograde and it will go back into Pisces one more time. So we're dealing with Piscean imagery and one of the things that Pisces is known for is, you know, with all the exalted mystical, spiritual, psychedelic, you know, transcendental stuff. It also is very connected to things like being scapegoated and victimization and, mm -hmm. and feeling as if one is being, uh, you know, pointed out and, 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 and being the, the focal point of other people's troubles and problems and in you know, the typical scapegoat stuff. That's very Piscean. And so what we have here is we have this image of Pisces that possesses her. And the, the song in the background is, I put a spell on you, <laughs> right? Screaming Jay Hawkins. Although what's interesting, they didn't use the original version of Screaming Jay Hawkins. They used the female version. Mm. So again, we've got this interesting kind of inverted piece going on. And she has to go back. She keeps going back. There's three connections with the talisman. She sees it. She sees it again. She's possessed by it. And then she has to go use her cell phone mm -hmm. to go to the Chase ATM get that money and then come back and pay for it. And when she does that, I don't, I don't think she breaks the spell, um, but she clearly gets the object of her desire and the object of her desire gets her. So I think this is interesting to point out. And of course the, the sponsor of the U S open is chase. The actual Arthur Ashe arena. If you look at it from up above, like if when you look when they do the, the up above views, it is in the shape of the chase symbol. The, that that the stadium is in the shape of chase symbol. So it is completely. I mean, it is basically a um, a church or a temple to the banking system. Right. Yep. Yeah. So, okay. So ooh, there you go. Um, so yeah, when you, so for like when, when I first saw the commercial, my first thoughts, cause of course you're great at pointing out some of the symbolism is what a weird commercial. She's like for a person who's supposed to be as impressive of an athlete as she is, she's not running very fast. Right. <laughs> right. She's in her workout uniform. She's being kind of lackadaisical, but her hair looks weird. She doesn't look particularly glamorous or attractive. And it's like weird. Like from some angles, she looks sort of like a female from some angles. She looks sort of like a male. I thought it was a weird commercial. I thought the necklace isn't even cute. She's obviously fixated on this thing that isn't even, in my opinion, an attractive necklace. I missed at first sort of the symbology of the, of the you know, fish bones and whatnot. But yeah, like when you pointed out to me that like we are, you know, even if you look at some of the imagery on the commercial, like where they're showing sort of the sunset and, and nothing much there, like we're down to the bone. There's really nothing much left to be revealed, right? And even when these final pieces are being revealed. People are getting caught up and paying attention to the stupid shit that we already know. They're not paying attention to these last little bits of stuff because guys, it's all out there right now. Not only is it all out there, but it is so out there that they are mocking everybody. Okay, yeah. so <clears throat> let's get into like what actually happened uh, at, the, at the US Open, right? Before you do that, do you want to yeah. talk about the other commercial? With yeah, 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 let's, let's do that, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's get the commercials because the mocking piece 
Yes. Is yes. definitely a part of that. Why don't you go ahead and break that one down? So I noticed about halfway into the U.S. Open, there was this commercial with, I couldn't understand exactly what the commercial was for. And it turns out it happens to be for Dr. Dre's Beats, who Dr. Dre had, you know, his Beats uh, headphones or whatever, right? right? Yeah, yeah. I didn't understand. That's not very clear from the commercial. It seems like it might be a commercial for Nicki Minaj or might be a commercial for Serena Williams I, or what for, I couldn't understand what it was for or for the U.S. Open. I couldn't understand. But it's basically Nicki Minaj and Serena Williams and a bunch of drag queens dancing around in the streets of Queens. And you can't actually tell. Like, I was having a hard time determining who was Nicki Minaj, who was Serena Williams, and who the drag queens were. Yeah. Right? And, and they're all, you know, in these kind of frou-frou, frilly dresses, which Serena Williams carried over into the tournament. She was wearing a literal tutu for the entire tournament of various colors. So, I mean... <laughs> So, you know, and then, of course, at the end of the commercial, Serena Williams has a lampshade on her head to signify illumination, and it says that she's the queen of queens, right? Um, you know, which plays at that TV show, The King of Queens, and also, you know, nods towards queens being where the U.S. Open is at. The whole thing was, I was just like, this is the weirdest commercial I have ever seen. It is so, I mean, it, would, you, would you agree it was such a strange commercial? It's utterly bizarre. I mean, so we have, again, this, the, the three comes into play. So we have a uh, Queens, we have drag Queens mm -hmm. and she, and she is crowned the queen. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's the number three. And then we also have this interesting thing going on with black and pink. Mm -hmm. And when, when, when you see the commercial, you'll see that half of the cast is in black and half of the cast is in pink. Right. So, it's not black and white anymore. It's black and pink and pink is the new white. And it's like, let's just eliminate white. Let's get white out of here. You know, let's bring pink into this. Pink is now at the same level as dual of duality as black. And so. Well, and then in, in the, in the U S open her outfits that were all these tutu dresses she was wearing were all split down the mid, like diagonally down the middle. One was black and brown and one was uh, brown and blue. Mm -hmm. Right. So they, they didn't go with the pink. I didn't see her wearing any pink uh, on court, but there you're right. It was never black and white or whatever. It was always some, um, you know, strange. I found the color combinations to be odd. Um, but this split, just like the black and pink, it's like this split of half and half. The outfit she wore in the tennis tournament looks somewhat similar to these. Go ahead. So one of the things that we'll probably touch on is this whole idea of Baphomet and uh, transgenderism Hermaphroditism. Her, and hermaphroditism. And so, yes. And the whole idea with Baphomet is, and the reason why Baphomet is such a popular symbol and fetish is that Baphomet is both sexes. Mm -hmm. it's, 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 you know, Baphomet has boobies and it's got male equipment. So this is why at this point in time in our history, these images of hermaphroditism, transgenderism, they're all very popular. We also have to understand that we're in Pluto and Capricorn, Saturn and Capricorn. Capricorn is the goat and Baphomet is a representation of the goat. So when we see this black and pink thing going on, it's an interesting resolution of duality. Hmm. It's no longer black and white, it's black and pink. What do we associate pink with? Well, generally we associate pink with LGBTQD, whatever, uh, and gay culture. So it's through gay culture melding with black, which is the color of Saturn, mm -hmm. which becomes the resolution of the black-white duality and the mm. challenge of bringing black and white together. Mm. So that part of the commercials is, is certainly very interesting because not only is it pink, but it's bringing together these people who represent, you know, this transgender hermaphroditic kind of representation of Baphomet. And then at the end, and this is what you and I were talking about a little bit earlier, she gets that lampshade. She's coronated as the queen, and the lampshade represents illumination. And so now we have the king, LeBron James, and we have the queen, Serena Williams. Mm -hmm. So these, these, are the, these are the new figureheads, the, the alternate royalty that have been crowned by mass media yep. and, and the, sort of the generators of culture that want to take everything and move it in a different direction. It's, it's an interesting, certainly it's an interesting move. And then you have that other commercial, the Nike commercial that came out the same week as the U.S. Open with Colin Kaepernick calling Serena Williams the greatest athlete of all times. That's right. 
right? So, so she, yeah, she's getting the she's getting the female LeBron James treatment right now. Yeah. So okay. So yeah, I mean, all that stuff is great. A great insight to this, you know, like we have all this transgender hermaphroditic stuff going on out in the culture, which I think is a distortion of human of of what should really be going on right now, which is humans balancing their masculine and feminine energies and traits within themselves, not not so much an outer representation of it. But we know that the, you know, the powers that shouldn't be loved to externalize everything, including uh, the method and the hierarchy, which is what's happening right now. <laughs> right, right. Revelation yeah. of the method. Yep. Yeah. Revel revelation of the method and externalization, and externalization of the hierarchy of the hierarchy are right. what they're showing us on every level right now. And people yeah. are missing it. And so let's go, let's hop over to what happened um, at the tournament, right? At, 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 at the U.S. Open. So, you know, Serena's been making her comeback all year from having a baby. She's, you know, there's been controversies about her outfits. She's been, there's been talk, although this has gotten a lot less uh, um, media attention than other stuff. She has had issues with missing drug tests this year as well. Um, she says they drug test her constantly. And apparently there was one time where she hid from them or side that hasn't gotten so much attention, but she's playing at the U S open. She's having a great tournament. You know, there was always the obligatory round where she played against her sister and she wiped her off the court. And, you know, then we get to this, you know, we get to the final. And if there is a situation where Serena may be basically playing someone who, who, is most similar to her in terms of power and game style, it would be Naomi Osaka, right? They're, they're, you know, Naomi Osaka, from what I can tell, is a female, but is a big girl, is strong, and has some similar appearance, and is coached by Serena Williams' old hitting partner, Sasha Bijan, right? So there's a lot of connection here. And of course, Naomi Osaka idolized Serena Williams, right? So they're in the tennis match, and, and, and Naomi Osaka's winning fairly easily. And I actually, I actually don't think that Serena has had has such a problem with what happened with Naomi Osaka beating her. I actually think that like Serena Williams on a certain level, there's like multiple things going on inside of her. On a certain level, she's aware of who she is and what her position is. On another level, she's not and she's totally emotionally attached to one this aspect of her tennis reality. And so I think she was getting beat and then I think it what really I think that like what they say happened is what really happened. I'm not convinced that it wasn't sort of a setup or a stage kind of thing in some way, but I think her reaction was organic. I think she was pissed. I do, I do agree with, I, I, you know, her coach Patrick Modiglu said he was coaching, but I do agree, I do believe her that she was not like looking for coaching. I mean, she's been at the top of tennis for years and years and never had a coaching violation. It's hard for me to believe that you know, at 36 or 37 years old, she's finally, she's doing that, but something got triggered in her. And this is, you know, so with all these things we're saying, just like when we talked about Joe Rogan, there's a part of me that appreciates some things about Serena Williams. And there's a part of me that sees her as a victim of this situation that she's in where she doesn't really, you know, she's been controlled by hands outside of herself for her whole life. And, you know, she's probably aware of some of it on a certain level, but not so aware on the other level. So what happened is she got a coaching violation, which is a warning, right? And she, this was in the, you know, in the beginning of the second set. And she started this ongoing argument with Carlos Ramos, who was known for giving lots of violations to men and to, to men, male players as well. But she felt like, you know, the, the warning was unfair and whatever. And so then when she got, when she broke her racket because she played a bad game, it was then a point violation because she'd already gotten a warning. And she had felt like, she had sorted out the, the warning violation with Carlos Ramos and that he shouldn't have taken the point and then that should have been the first warning. But that isn't what happened. And then it devolved into this thing that, you know, she got mad and they called out the, the, the referee for the tournament and then he gave her a, a whole game violation. And it took away from this thing with Naomi Osaka. But she's out there and while all of this is going on, and I think these are her, I think she was mad. I think these are her real feelings. I think, you know, you're seeing all of this conflict going on inside of her. She is taking this as an affront to her because she's a woman and she's out there saying, oh, I'm fighting. I'm out here fighting for women's rights. Like, I don't actually, you're out there playing a tennis match, right? Like yeah. that isn't really the yeah. place to, to fight for women's rights, except for that we live in a complete and total SJW culture. And someone pointed out in the comment section of Robert's show the other night that Serena Williams initials are SJW, 
which if we're living in a simulation, as I believe we are, codes her as the perfect star of this kind of show, right? So she's out there fighting for women's rights with the coach about, you know, warnings. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense. She didn't go to the race card. She went to the, the, the you know, the sexist card and, and, you know, the mother card and all that kind of stuff. But what most people missed is that in that argument with Carlos Ramos, she referred to, she said, I've seen other men do the same thing and not get a violation. And then she did it again in the press conference after, referred to them as other men. Thank you very much to Paul Romano from Pockets of the Future for being much more on top of catching things really quickly than I am able to be. And he has these original videos on his channel. Um, he does a great job, guys. I, 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 if you guys aren't subscribed to Pockets of the Future, I fully suggest you should be. Um, he caught these original uh, streams which have now, at least as far as I can tell, been edited because when I saw a later video that showed the same situation, it didn't say other men anymore, it said men. You can still find the original videos on, on, on uh, Pockets of the Future. She said it twice and then just yesterday he put up a video and I had forgotten about this as well, I've seen this before, of several years back where she in an on-court interview referred to her sister Venus as he. So this is a lot of slippage, but this is, you know, so whether she knows and she's letting it out or whether they're triggering her and she's letting it out. I don't know what's going on. I mean, you know, like I don't know what it is, but that's the real revelation here. You have Serena Williams out there in a tutu, right? In a tutu, like the most masculine looking female tennis player we've probably ever seen, right? In a tutu out there screaming about women's rights, you know, and referring to herself essentially as a man. Right, and this is the whole, so whether that was intentional or not intentional, that's the story right there. And everybody's arguing about whether this is a good call or a bad call or a sexist thing or a not sexist thing or there's, I mean, there's been endless amounts of, of attention paid to this and not one person outside of our little, you know, circle on the internet has picked this up, right? And, and, to me, that's, this is where the real story is. They are mocking everybody. This whole thing, right? How is it that like there was so much weird gendery stuff going on in these commercials and then this happens and she says that, right? right? Like this is all, um, it's all, it's all too much. So you have a person who is possibly not a woman out there fighting for screaming and yelling about being persecuted and fighting for women's rights. And it, you know, as usual, the public misses the point. <laughs> they get too involved. That's what the purpose of all this SJW shit is to get people all riled up about something that, you know, either doesn't actually exist or exists on a minor level off to the right. So they miss that there's a filet mignon on the plate. They're right. worried. They're arguing over whether the mashed potatoes are tasty or not. Right. I mean, it's like, it's like people have this, this giant fish hook that just, just gets implanted into their third chakra. And then they just get yanked around and pulled around mm -hmm. by their, their emotional state mm -hmm. and, and this, this power center and, you know, how they give their power away in these mm -hmm. highly sort of charged and often now um, emotional moments that, you know, everything's emotional. It's all emotional. It's all Everything. emotional. All, all that matters is feelings. Yeah, hook, line, and sinker. Yeah. Yeah. Hook, 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 line, and sinker, which takes us back to the fish. Right? Right. <laughs> Absolutely. And Serena, you know, whether or not she has a beef, um, she, she plays the role of a victim there. Yep. And that gets she's, back she's to the She's known place for her dominance. Her. She is known for being the most dominating athlete in history. And then she plays the victim. And so the polarity here is incredible, right? Yeah. And then the other thing that was interesting is before the match, and I could be wrong about this, but I've never seen it, and I've watched hundreds of her matches. They, I've seen these videos on the internet, like uh, on an interesting channel called Trans World. <laughs> but it was, it's an old channel, and it's about sports, but I think it's funny. It's called Trans World, where right. they're showing these videos of her and her sister training as kids. And, I mean, go look at those guys. So they, they look were like little boys. showing that on ESPN, which I've never seen them do. So I actually think that they were giving the heads up that like, we're going to let it out right here, guys. You mm -hmm. know, we're going to let it out and no one's going to get it. And so whatever happens from here on out, we told you so. So, you know, we don't have any more responsibility about anything. That's right. Uh, yeah. So 
it's so fascinating. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's so obvious to me and it's so crazy how people can't see this. And, you know, I don't know if you have anything else to say, say about this. I mean, we, but this kind of also carries us over. And we can talk for a few minutes about this strange uh, interview that uh, Elon Musk and Joe Rogan had, but he, in a very, in a slightly different way, but in, you know, in, the, in another way, exactly the same, Elon Musk is playing a similar role in his arena. It isn't about gender, but it's about something else. Yeah. Before we go to Elon Musk, I just want to wrap up the Serena thing really, really quickly. Okay. Um, I think it's interesting that her husband's name is Alexis. Yes. Right. It's a male with a feminine name. Yep. And um, look at how much more narrower his shoulders are than hers. Exactly. He looks very feminine. Very effeminate. He almost pretty. Yeah. 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 And the other thing too, which is interesting, I just want to just do a quick uh, share screen on the chart that took place during the meltdown. So this is the meltdown chart, just really quickly, which you'll see here. And, and I just, I just picked it's all up over on one side like that. Well, that's Serena. Yeah. That's, that's her. Yeah. She's got, she's got a massive stellium in Libra of all planets, which, which is, is about balance, which is male and female. That is so fascinating. Wow. So, so what's also interesting is that, the judge's name is Ramos, right? Yeah, Carlos Ramos, yeah. Ramos, that's the ram. Yeah. That, that's Aries, that's male, that's male energy. Yeah. Okay, if you look at the chart, you'll see that uh, the highest, it's not really technically the highest point, like the highest point in the chart would probably be Saturn. So, you know, Saturn is the Lord of Judgment. Mm -hmm. And all those judges, by the way, were dressed in black. So they're all in the color of Saturn. They're all clad yep. in Saturn, Saturnalia. But look at where Mars is. Mars is, is really, I mean, if you look at it just from a kind of a, a clock perspective, Mars is at high noon. Mm -hmm. So Mars is the ruler of Aries or the ram, right? So we have this Mars energy at the top of the chart, and it's squaring off against almost everything that's Venusian or Libran in Venus's chart, in, sorry, Serena's chart. The other thing that I thought was interesting here, too, is not only was Mars squaring from this angle down, but Ser of Serena's Mars is down here, which is in the very dramatic sign of Leo, mm -hmm. is over here, and it's squaring. She has Venus and Scorpio, by the way. Um, and she has a transiting Jupiter was right on Venus. So anytime you get Jupiter on a planet, what does it do? It, it expands everything. It makes it bigger. And so what we have here is we've got a Mars square to Jupiter, which is getting into this conflict around Venus and Scorpio. And when we talk about Scorpio, we talk about transformation and going from one state to another, right? And then yeah. the, fi the final piece um, is this Uranus over here, which is in the sign of Taurus. And it is actually, uh, by degree, opposing her Mercury in Libra and transiting Venus, Trans Venus, right? Yeah. Trans Venus opposing Uranus, which is radical, and there's going to be something disruptive about this moment. Yeah. That is that is the nature of the whole deal. And look where Uranus is. It's right on her ascendant. Yeah. So there this is this is not the end of the story nope. for Serena Williams. We're gonna see more of this, and at some point we are gonna be talking about the transformation of her identity. That is coming. Yeah. Yeah, you, you said that all the way last year on our show. You talked that her identity would be transforming over the next period, the next couple. You weren't sure she'd return to tennis, but you said there would be, a, I remember you said there would be a transformation of, of her public identity. So we'll see what it is. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So you, want, you want to unwrap the, uh, the Musk Rogan thing? Yeah, I think we can just do that kind of fairly quickly. I mean, for any of you who saw that interview, it was very strange. I mean, who talks like that? I have never, I mean, just first of all it was boring mostly but the way he talks this is not human whatever elon musk is um and you know some i mean just listening to him talk forget about the content of anything he was saying just the way he speaks is disturbing but you know do you have any thoughts on that before i kind of give my assessment of why it's similar to the serena williams thing well he likes taking ambien <laughs> And I think that I think that might have a short term and long term effect on him. But he also he, he also might just be 
an AI, which is, I think, where you're going with this, right? Yeah, I mean, so basically, I mean, he's something, like there's some, some kind of cyborg, non-human, whatever. But this is what they do. So you have Elon Musk there, right? And, and he's been doing this for like the last year, year and a half, warning people about AI, very concerned about AI, when he himself appears to be AI. He's, and he, the thing he's offering is the solution to the AI is AI. He's basically saying that, you know, we need to make some sort of neural lace or neural link to sort of protect the, the brain, you know? So he's offering a um, cyborgification of the human mind, right? Of the human as the solution to the cyborgification of the human. Right. And this is what they do, right? So they're, you know, they have a, they have a, a person who may not be a woman out there fighting for women's rights, right? And then you have a person that is AI warning us that AI is coming, right? Yeah. It's kind of like their offering is the solution to the chemtrails, the chemtrails. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, absolutely. So this is what, I mean, we are being like literally spun around and, and people are sitting there and thinking that Elon Musk is a genius and he's got this otherworldly intelligence. No, he's not. Go, to, go check out what Miles Mathis has to say about Elon Musk. That's probably closer to the truth. Yeah. But uh, I don't know if I agree 100% with all the things Miles says, but I, I like his take on stuff. But he, would be, he would be a good guest for Joe Rogan. He, oh, yeah, but he doesn't do interviews. Randy's tried to get him. Yeah, um, no, he doesn't. He and doesn't. You, know what, you know who would also be a good guest for Rogan? It would be Cliff High. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, it would be very interesting. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, so whatever is going on with Elon Musk, I mean, he's there to confuse people about what Tesla and Tesla energy really is. He's mm -hmm. there to, um, romance, you know, he's like a different face on the AI kind of thing than your Ray Kurzweil or whatever. Um, but people don't, this is a, I mean, <laughs> I and mean, it's hilarious that what everybody's talking about from the interview is, oh, he smoked pot, now his stock is down or whatever. Like the, pub, the, the mainstream is not talking about just how disturbing his, um, his disposition and his, how he presents himself is. And that, again, he's doing, you know, uh, Hegelian dialectic and problem reaction solution shit. No one ever catches that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's true. And it, it was a very... It was a very odd, very odd interview. So weird. And, you and know, Joe Rogan was kissing his ass, dude. Joe Rogan was like, oh, you're a genius. Oh, your mind is so amazing. Oh, you know? Yeah. I, 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 Joe Rogan has like self-esteem issues around his intellect. I think that's what sure. it kind of, Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> the noble savage. Joe Rogan, the noble savage. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so... I, but even even if, when Joe Rogan kind of rolls out the red cop carpet, his his show tends to be almost like this um, this death knell for people that come on there. Like mm -hmm. people's lives or careers or public perceptions are radically altered in many cases, not for the better. Mm -hmm. You know, I went over this like Alex Jones went yeah, on the show, yeah. and soon after that, Alex Jones is. You know, he's, he's, you know, trying to come up for air. He's, he's, in fact, I don't even think Alex Jones has any public access at no. this point. Like Apple pulled his app from the iTunes. Store. Yeah. Well, it seems like some people go on Joe Rogan's show and that blows up their career. They, they, they were nobody right. and then there's somebody and others come on there and, and they lose all their, you know, credibility or whatever. Like it seems to be, he's the, like the, um, he's the junction. He's the, um, the, the, the cross section where things come to go, go to either live or die. That's right. He's the crossroads. Joe Rogan yeah. is the crossroads. Interesting. Yeah. It's a really interesting metaphor. I would totally agree with that. Now, you saw the Tulsi Gabbard interview. What was that like? So you'll just hit that real quick. So this is, and this goes to the point I made on our show about Joe Rogan about, oh, he's the sort of new updated modern day Charlie Rose, right? So it was actually a decent interview. Like there was nothing to like out there that came about, but it was a chance to listen to her for an hour and a half, which you never get to on the mainstream because she actually is, makes sense. She actually is not like completely, obviously a corporate bought off, paid off shill. So she has some things to say that sound reasonable. So sure. you can't let her talk for more than a minute and a half on the mainstream media. So it was a good interview. She got to sit and talk. You got a feel for her. My sense of her is that she seems to be a fairly decent person if that exists in Washington, DC. Um, and he, I think did a fair, he didn't, he could have, I think he could have asked some more interesting questions, but, 
what, like literally this is the most we've ever gotten to see or know about Tulsi Gabbard. And why is it with Joe Rogan? Mm -hmm. This, you know what I mean? Like this is now, is she about to blow up or is her career about to die? We'll see what happens. Oh, right? I, th I think she's going off in a different vector than say Steven Tyler. Okay. Right. That's, that's what I think. And I shared with you the other day that she's CFR. Yeah, Which I didn't I, know that. I yeah. was very surprised that she was CFR. For I'm surprised too. But uh, on one level, I'm surprised. But on another level, like, nope, I'm not surprised. Like, this mm -hmm. is, you know, like, is she there to, like, they're starting, to, you know, they're starting to recognize that, like, they have to build a little bit bigger of a pen that's slightly more well-decorated. Otherwise, the sheep are going to leave, right? That's right. So, you know, she you put her there. She says some things that are totally right and make sense. She does seem like a decent human being. You know what I mean? But she also still strongly believes in the role of government, right? right. So that's the most important thing is to retain people's belief in authority. And right. so whatever they have to do, however they have to dress that up, they're going to do it and they're going to present it with the new Charlie Rose, who also is a member of the CFR. Is Joe Rogan a member of the CFR? <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Has Joe Rogan been to Bohemian Grove? <laughs> No, he just talks about Alex having gone. Okay. All right. Um, well, this has been great, Emily. This is a nice yeah. little thing we're doing here. Yeah. Well, cool, guys. So we look forward to doing this every week. We'll see you guys next week. And um, you can catch Robert, get a reading from him at robertphoenix.com. And if you would like a diet, wellness, or lifestyle consultation, hit me up on Facebook at Emily Moyer. And we will see you guys next week. Or, and find me off planetradio.com. All righty, guys. Toodaloo. Cool.